everybody, and welcome back to Jamestown Settlement. Now, so far, we've seen some of the science involved in investigating these ancient mysteries. But now, let's take a look at the math concepts used. And I bet you'll know a few of them. Now, you know that a number line is a series of numbers that begin at the origin, zero, and move away from that origin in both a positive direction and a negative direction toward infinity. Each division of a number line always represents the same increment. We use number lines to compare data. Sometimes, when scientists compare data, they use number lines. Now, on a number line, the number to the left is always less in value than the number to the right. You can graph integers on a number line by drawing a dot. For example, let's graph 5 on the number line. Now, start at the origin and move five spaces to the right. Okay, now let's graph negative three on the number line. Start again at the origin and move three spaces to the left. Let's take a couple of minutes and try the following example. Draw a number line from negative 10 to 10. Graph the integers 9 and negative 7. Graph the numbers you think might be their opposite integers. Teachers, this might be a good time to pause the tape so that students can give this a try. Welcome back, guys. Well, let's see how you did. The number line you made should have looked like this, with the origin or zero in the middle. Each integer on the number line has an opposite integer that is equally distanced from the origin. For example, let's look at the number nine. It is nine spaces from the origin to the right. Its opposite integer is negative nine. Both numbers are an equal distance on the number line from the origin. You should have also plotted negative seven and seven using the same method. Now, don't worry if you didn't get it right the first time. You can try again later, now that you know how. Now that you understand number lines, let's continue. Depending on the data that scientists are analyzing, they may need to use what we call the rectangular coordinate system. Now this system consists of not one, but two number lines. These number lines cross at their origins and are perpendicular to each other. The area they create is called a plane. A plane is a two-dimensional object. The central point where the two lines cross is called the origin. Each number line now has a special name. The horizontal number line is called the x-axis. The vertical number line is called the y-axis. Now, the x and y axes divide the plane into four sections called quadrants. These quadrants are labeled counterclockwise as the first, second, third, and fourth. Now, remember, where the two axes cross is called the origin. Points to the right and above the origin are labeled with positive numbers, one, two, three, etc. Points to the left and below the origin are labeled with negative numbers, negative one, negative two, negative three, and so forth. When plotting numbers in the rectangular coordinate system, we use coordinates. Now, these coordinates are the addresses of those points and are called ordered pairs. The first coordinate then is called the x-coordinate. The second is called the y-coordinate. Now we always write these coordinates as pairs with the first number representing the x-axis position and the second number representing the y-axis position. So what do you think the ordered pair is for the origin? Well, if you guessed zero, zero, you are absolutely right. Let's take a closer look. We use ordered pairs of numbers to describe positions of points on the rectangular plane. The ordered pair 2, 3 means over positive 2 and up positive 3. However, the ordered pair 3, 2 means over positive 3 and up positive 2. Where do you suppose the point negative 3, negative 2 is located? Well, in this case, the x-coordinate is a negative number. You would move three places to the left of the origin. And since the y-coordinate is a negative number, you would move two spaces down. Working in groups, let's see if you can graph the following coordinate pairs. E equals four, negative two. C equals two, zero. 
A equals 0, 1, P equals negative 2, negative 1, and S equals negative 4, 1. Teachers, this would be a good time to pause while students give this a try. Okay guys, let's see how you did. Here's what your coordinate points should look like. Don't be discouraged if yours doesn't come out perfect the first time. Later on, you can go back and try it again. You know, many times scientists have to go back and recheck their work to correct their mistakes. Now that you know how to plot points using the rectangular coordinate system, can you think of when you might have already used this system? <laughs> Norbert and Zot are using it right now. We use the rectangular coordinate system all the time. In fact, knowing how to locate points on a coordinate grid can actually help you locate points on a map. Let's take a look at Norbert and Zot. Can you describe their position? Can you describe their position now? By using a coordinate system, it is much easier to describe the position of objects in the real world. A coordinate is a point on a line. Two lines perpendicular to each other create a plane. Positions in this plane are labeled using two coordinates called an ordered pair. Now in the science world, maps are an example of how we use the rectangular coordinate system to describe the location of items on the Earth's surface. This special type of map is called a topographical map. Sometimes scientists need to plot data that is three-dimensional. To describe three-dimensional images, we can just simply add another axis to our rectangular coordinate system and plot points in three dimensions. Let's visit with the students in Pasadena, Texas, who used the rectangular coordinate system to complete a math and science activity. Hello, and welcome to Sophomore Intermediate School. We want to show you a cool activity that you can try in your own classroom. You can view and download this detailed description of how to do this lesson in your classroom from the NASA Connect website. Working in groups, we build imaginary environments instead of shoe boxes. We had to keep it top secret from all the other groups. Some of us included cool features like ponds, mountains, and trees. Next, we covered our environments with foil that had a grid marked on it. Then came the fun part. We traded our shoebox environments with another group. We got to act like investigators, trying to figure out what the environment in the box was without actually seeing it. We took turns using a screw to probe what might be in the box. Each person measured the depth of their probe. On our data sheets, we were careful to match our measurements for each probe to the correct coordinates of the foil grid. We're only allowed to choose 50 different probes. This made me realize just how accurate scientists would have to be when they map an area of land. Some groups use their data to create topographical maps of what they thought was in the shoeboxes. Other groups use their graphing program to create their topographical maps. The best part was when we got to look inside the shoe boxes and compare our drawings to what was really there. I'll bet that's how explorers will feel when they finally visit some place like Mars. We hope you tried an activity with your class. That looks like so much fun. I wish I could have been there with you. Now let's take a look at how NASA's only archaeologist, Tom Seaver, and other researchers are using the rectangular coordinate system, remote sensing, and GIS to answer questions about an ancient culture. 